Rick Hogue, welcome to the show. I'm so glad to finally have you here. We talked about having you on the show. Could you tell uh, the audience a little bit about yourself and Virtual Legality, your YouTube channel? Yeah, absolutely. I'm just your everyday average corporate lawyer with a YouTube channel. So yeah, my name is Richard Hogue. Um, I've been doing mergers and acquisitions, venture capital and corporate transactions law since about 2005. I started my own firm in 2016. And one of the things that came along with starting your own firm in the 21st century was trying to figure out how to market that firm, how to talk to people more directly in a fashion that wasn't the same as every other big law firm on earth. When I left to start my own place, I was an equity partner at a big law firm here in Michigan, and I didn't want to market as essentially smaller, hopefully cheaper and better than just a big firm. And so one of the things I wound up doing is I wound up sponsoring things that I really liked, that I really found were great informational sources on the internet, like MGO blog, I'm a diehard Michigan Wolverine, and like the Easy Allies, because I'm a diehard video gamer. And so I really found their kind of positivity to be exactly what I wanted to see more of in the world. And as part of that process, the Easy Allies, Kyle Bossman, Brandon Jones, a couple of the other ones, wound up asking me through email to speak on various video game related legal topics. At that point in time, it was uh, Bungie losing uh, or Activision losing Bungie, uh, EA buying Respawn, the Titanfall developer, all these things that were corporate law adjacent, intellectual property, which I think we're going to talk about a little bit on this video. Yeah. And through the course of that interaction and some radio programming I was doing to market the firm at the same time, I said, you know, maybe I should try to do this more often in a YouTube channel. And, and my wife, of course, always supportive. She's great. She's very supportive now. Rolled her eyes and said, nobody's ever going to listen to that, Rick. And I said, <laughs> okay, yeah, no, but we're, I'm interested in it. We'll see if we can uh, get it going. And like all YouTube stories, you know, we spent a year plus kind of with my favorite 100 and 110 subscribers, really enjoying that interaction, really enjoying that community, yeah. uh, and then kind of busted out this year. So we, we just crossed 20,000, which is just, I, I don't even know what to say about that. A big surprise for me. It was 17 uh, and we two days ago. That's incredible. Yeah. <laughs> You're blowing up. It was. Yeah, yeah no, I put, up a, I put up a tweet or a post that said, essentially, you know, it took us 600 days to get to 10,000, uh, and then it took us less than three months to get to 20. Um, so it's just been that kind of growth curve and, and it's been enjoyable. It's been fun, uh, so, you know, dealing with YouTube comments, having those interactions is, <laughs> is interesting because I try to keep things very amenable. One of the things we like to say on virtual legality is reasonable minds can differ. Mm -hmm. um, and that whole channel is really about talking about business and law and the things that I'm experienced in through the prism of the things that people otherwise like to read and talk about, yeah. you know, movies and television and video games. And you're going to be reading about Spider-Man was lost by the MCU and Disney and Sony are fighting about it or the halo delay or anything else. Yeah. You're going to be interested in those things, but there are so many business and legal considerations that go along with all of that, that hopefully virtual legality is a place where you can get a little bit better understanding of why that article came out and why those choices were being made yeah. and why the WB games sale is still on, regardless of what Eurogamer might've told you two days ago, that kind of thing. Yeah. And, and I was drawn to, like, I reached out to you because of your involvement with Easy Allies. I, yeah. I listened to them with some regularity. And, uh, and, and so, yeah, your insight was very valuable. And as an artist, and this is where I think, you know, my audience is going to be coming from at the same time, which I, I think is like, for a lot of artists, you know, we feel like lawyers are, uh, they're out of touch with the entertainment industry <laughs> in a lot of cases. Well, they are, and, yeah. Unless they're entertainment lawyers, in which case they're out of, you know, most of our price ranges of anybody yeah. we could get any legal advice from. But you sure. seem like you were very interested in gaming and you were very interested in uh, uh, creative uh, industries and entertainment. And so yeah. you had some insights. And so like, I, you know, when I found out you had your own channel, I was like, oh man, I got to go check this out. Found some really great uh, informative information there. I thought you could really shed some light on a lot of these issues that a lot of artists that uh, that follow me and my channel would be interested to know about for instance if you don't mind we could jump right into it absolutely uh, uh, now you've covered this a little bit but if you could uh, maybe elaborate a little bit specifically for uh, this audience specifically I want to ask you about uh, fan art now I sure. I know that fan art is gonna sell if I do a spider-man uh, drawing I could draw it on uh, ink on paper and I could post it online and I could sell that and or yeah. I could even hey I could go so far as to go to conventions and make prints of you know somebody else's character and sell that right but there are yep. some legal uh, uh, issues here and if you need to put a disclaimer before you say anything <laughs> I understand I know that's an important thing uh, but could you could you explain to uh, us us artists uh, who don't have a definitive answer on this you know yeah. is it legal for us to make and sell 
uh, I know some of this, but I'm going to let you tell them <laughs> <laughs> to make and sell artwork of, say, Spider-Man or somebody sure. else's copyrighted property. Sure. No. Yeah. And the disclaimer can be a simple one. We don't need to go full legalese here. Basically, nobody I'm talking to right now uh, on this channel elsewhere on my channel is my client. So for ethics reasons, I can't give you formal legal advice on your specific situation. What I can give is generalized educational and hopefully informational conversation pieces about the status of the legal framework under which you're operating. Um, so with that as the disclaimer, uh, yeah, you know, fan art, fan games, it's one of those situations, and this happens really across the whole pop culture landscape, where you see so much of it out there in the world, your immediate reaction is, well, it has to be legal or quasi-legal because it just exists everywhere. And if these places wanted to stop it, if it was illegal, they absolutely could. But the framework is really one that I like to call largesse on my channel. You might have heard that term, which is to say, your first question was, is it legal? The broad strokes answer is, probably not to almost definitely not. Um, you know, when we talk about something like Spider-Man, Marvel owns Spider-Man. And as a copyright holder, Marvel has the exclusive bundle of rights under the law to do a number of things, but specifically to make derivative works, to make new things based on the character that they own, and to sell those, to distribute them. And so when you go and you make a derivative work of somebody else's intellectual property, then that is an exclusion. You're not allowed to do that under the law. Only they can do it under the law. They can license you to do it. All these intellectual property owners that you know and you read about in magazines and newspaper articles, they license other people to do things for them. That's how Sony makes a Spider-Man movie. Sony doesn't own Spider-Man. They license the rights to make Spider-Man movies from Marvel um, before they were Disney. And so you go out and you say, hey, I'm going to draw this Spider-Man uh, picture and I'm going to put it out for sale. Broad strokes, you call up a lawyer. Can I do this? Lawyer says no. Um, legally speaking, you can't do it. But the practical, the real politic of this whole thing is, you know, it does exist. And there are a number of areas in the law, especially in copyright, where the things that are being done are allowed by the copyright holders. The, the, the big confusion that I see on my channel a lot is one that I think springs from trademark, where a trademark holder actually has to defend their trademark from, from misuse. A copyright holder doesn't have to do that. A copyright holder can look at the thing and say, you know what? Uh, we feel that the sales of our Spider-Man comic book goes up when Trent and other folks are making uh, drawings uh, at these conferences and people are enjoying the Spider-Man brand and they're celebrating Spider-Man. And so we could come down hard on them if we wanted to, but we look at it and say, yeah, you know what? This isn't so bad. It's like streaming, so, right? This is this is what exactly we see with streaming. streaming. They're like, hey, we get sales when Dr. Disrespect streams our game. So like, why are we yeah. going to stop them? Yeah. And that largesse is a problem from a legal perspective. You know, a lawyer's perspective looks at it and says, well, you know, largesse means that the content holder could bring a hammer down on you whenever they want. Yeah. Uh, and so you're kind of living in this zone where I, I wouldn't recommend you make your livelihood at it, but you use it as a springboard to make a different kind of livelihood. I, I don't think that's necessarily the biggest deal in the world. And certainly the lawyer would tell you, if you get that cease and desist letter, you listen to it immediately. Uh, it's, it's, they've got the winning argument there. And we can talk about fair use if you want to and, and dive into that a little bit. But that's well, a bit of a red herring. We see that, yeah. with, we see that with fan games all the time, yeah. too. And, and like I get why Nintendo, for instance, would be upset about somebody making a Castlevania fan game. Because it's like, well, maybe they're planning a 2D you right. know, Castlevania game or Metroid or whatever it is. And, and they don't want to have that cross uh, mix, misunderstanding that this is a, a licensed Metroid game or a licensed castle. Right. Game. And they don't control that brand identity. Right. right. So and they're they very meticulous. The third act. Yeah. yeah. They don't own the third act of the game. If the Castlevania that you're making winds up having a political statement about Trump or Biden or whoever, right. they right. don't want that. That's yeah. not what they're trying to sell. Right. And so you understand that the copyright holder has these kinds of vested interests. On the other hand, you know, there's another way to market your company where, especially if you're smaller or an indie video game company or, or art company, you say, well, we really want to be seen as consumer friendly. We yeah. really want to support these kinds of things. And so, yes. you know, you can put out forum posts. You can put out these written communications and say, we support all this fan art yeah. until maybe you get a little dicey or racy. And then you say, OK, come on. Those are our characters. Re reel it back a little it bit. It always happens. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so you do have these kinds of situations. But at the end of the day, from a legal perspective, you, you're operating in a copyright infringing capacity. And as you yeah. said, streaming is a great example of this. One of the videos that I wound up doing was how a person that was streaming FIFA games wound up getting the hammer brought down on them. And Electronic Arts struck 16 videos of theirs in a row because at some point they decided to start doing ad hominem attacks against Electronic Arts and making all these claims that Electronic Arts didn't like and reflected poorly oh, on them. No. And so they said, hey, well, 
this was always infringing. So now that you've done something that we don't like, we, we'll just we'll just pull the sword on you. And, and that can always be something that happens. But well, let's talk about consequences, like, yeah, because this is the big, scary part. What you're saying is like you're doing something that's illegal. You're infringing yeah. on somebody's copyright. So are we talking jail time here? Are we, are we just talking slap on the wrist? Like, what is the extent of the, the, the power that the rights holder has over the situation? Yeah, so not usually. We're not usually talking about jail time. For one thing, again, kind of getting to the real politic. And in all honesty, if you haven't sat down with a lawyer on any specific issue in your life, this is what a good lawyer does is talks to you about the realities of the situation. We can talk about how bad it could be, but the, the actual reality here is even the Nintendos of the world that are so meticulous or anybody else that controls their copyright, it's generally bad marketing to slap some poor somebody who was a fan of their work and, and really make their lives miserable. Right. And so you can get a cease and desist and say, hey, you know, those letters are usually very gently written. It says, we are so happy that you're a big fan of Sonic the Hedgehog, but could you please not do that? Yeah, I was uh, just thinking that, of that one because they actually hired some of the people that were making yeah. fan games of their product because they're like, hey, people, this is resonating with our audience. These yeah. developers, they may be indie, but they get it. You know, they get yeah, what our audience right wants. Why would yeah. we like and, and I wish that Nintendo, I wish that uh, many of these other studios would recognize, look, you've got some really passionate, talented developers out there that are making fan games. Maybe we hire them, but then it also encourages a double-edged sword because then they encourage people to <laughs> breach yeah. their uh, copyright, you know, so it is a trade-off. Yeah, you hear that story and you're like, oh, I can make a fan game and I can make official Sonic the Hedgehog. Yeah, no, you, you always run that risk. And certainly, you know, Sega might be the exception. You do see kind of a cultural difference. The Western companies tend to allow it a little bit more. They tend to see the value in streaming a little bit more yeah. versus Atlas and Nintendo tend to come out with, if they allow streaming at all, these, these lists of rules uh, as to what the streaming will be. Uh, and, and so you asked whether it would be a slap on the wrist or jail time. It, it's really neither. You're very likely, if you're not a big industrial copyright infringer, to get a cease and desist letter. And if you were to ask counsel, you should listen to that. Right. Um, so but, go in knowing that at any moment yeah. they can shut you down. But, exactly. But it is for a lot of artists that I know, I've been doing comic books and I do the comic con circuits and I see there are people who make a living just doing Star Wars fan art sure. at comic cons. I mean, it's probably a tough year for those guys, you know, but yeah. there are a lot of people they'll just do like, hey, this is like Star Wars high school. And, you know, it's their take. It's like a different take on it. So sometimes that actually gets a licensing deal or or they, they get a good uh, relationship with the license holder. And then yeah. they end up making product out of it, like little action figures that are graffiti style inspired Star Wars figures, for example. You know, that started from something that was just a fan made thing. And so sometimes it can be really good for jumpstarting a, a, a well, getting people to notice what you're doing and 100%. Without, with and, and, and making a few bucks. You know, but if, yeah, you, no. if your plan is to like go into like, hey, I'm going to make Star Wars T-shirts, you know, and that's my business, the cornerstone of my business. I think you got a real problem with your business model. Yeah. I mean, you have to, in my opinion on this, and this isn't legal, this is just strategy as to mm -hmm. you're going to get that letter. And if you get that letter, you're going to just stop. Right. Then it's, it's what kind of calculation you have to do for the resources that you're going to put into this thing. Right. Like you can go on to Etsy right now and you can get every single Disney princess, every Star Wars, anything that you ever want. I, I saw my wife looking at these. I'm like, well, that's interesting. Those almost certainly aren't licensed. Yeah. And you go down that and you say, well, for the most part, Disney doesn't care if you're not putting them in a compromising position and they're going to allow this because it's useful to them. They, oh, it gets more people in love with Disney and these kinds of things. But occasionally, yeah. if somebody's really industrial, if it comes out on Fortune 500 or in Forbes and said this Etsy person is actually making three million a year. When there's Disney real goes, money involved. Yeah, That's Disney goes, hey, <laughs> what? Yeah. yeah. You know, say, well, give us a cut. Until then, uh, you know, I was in I was in Thailand and I saw a whole shelf of uh, of toys. And it looked like, you know, X-Wings and stuff like that. I got up closer. It's Star Wobs. It's not oh, Star, sure, yeah. the Star Wobs. It looks just like the Star Wars logo. <laughs> I'll put them, if, I, if I still have the photos, I'll put them up in the video. But Star Wobs, well, yeah. And the other side of the coin there is that I think yeah. you've seen a, a couple of stories, Star Wars in particular, hmm. where there's been accusations of essentially Disney taking and making their reference books using like fan art that's on DeviantArt or yeah. wherever. Yeah. And, and so you run that risk because one of the things that happens here is you've made an infringing derivative work. It's yours. You made it, but it's something based off another's intellectual property. And you're really foreclosed from suing over them stealing that particular thing. Right. Because they have the exclusive right to make those works. And so you can go and sue them on that. Right. But the judge is very likely to say, well, 
you didn't have the right to make it. So what do you want me to do? So you're saying that 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 Scotty Young fan art that he did of my character, I could use that as a cover even without his permission because it's yeah. my character. Well, what I would say is the same thing I say on my channel a lot is that what is legal is not always right. And what is right is not always legal. I'm not so saying I would do it. <laughs> yeah, no, ethically and morally, I might say, well, do you really want to do that? Yeah, but yeah, yeah. from a legal perspective, they wouldn't be able to, in all likelihood, have a successful suit against you because they never had the right to make the work in the first place. Right. But there, yeah, there are a lot of people. And even I've considered that like, man, you know, I just do a lot of uh, fan art of other other people's things. But yeah, they can go ahead and just use that because... I don't own the copyright to those characters and I can't use them. So, yeah. It's a very tricky suit to try to go defend that. Absolutely. Yeah. Hopefully we covered we covered that to uh, from the perspective of artists who are considering doing more fan art to a pretty lengthy degree. Uh, and I, I, there are a couple other questions, if you don't mind. Uh, Absolutely. I, I'd love to dig into. Uh, one, uh, this, this one might be a little shorter. So when I was a young artist, I signed contracts. I had publishing deals, 16 oh, yeah. years old, 18 years old, uh, 19 years old. I was lucky if I was making, you know, $30,000, $40,000 a year. That's, you know, I'm signing deals that are only doing a few thousand dollars. You know, like that, if I know, I knew that I couldn't go to a lawyer because yeah. If I go to a lawyer, they're going to take $800 of that. This is all before taxes, by the way. So sure. I got a $3,000 contract and I'm going to spend $500 to $800 just to get a legal advice or get a lawyer to read this and give me some yeah. feedback. What advice would you give to somebody who's in that situation where it's like, I'm not doing big deals. You know, uh, uh, if I'm a young guy or a young girl out there and I'm, I'm, I'm looking at a contract from a potential publisher or something like that, I'm not doing a big, you know, tens of thousands or even you know, or more types of deals. And that would cut too much into my profits to even afford a lawyer. What kind of advice would you give somebody to seek legal counsel or look things to look for to protect their rights as a creator? Yeah. Uh, could you touch on this subject a little bit? Yeah. So this is important stuff when we're talking about intellectual property, because there are a lot of ways for, uh, you know, I hate to say bad faith people, but people that are used to kind of manipulating the, the legal language to put intellectual property provisions in contracts that do more than you think and that are very difficult to kind of suss out potholes uh, in, in these kinds of contracts. Yeah, so my know. recommendation is, as you might suspect, that counsel with the lawyer is probably a good idea. Um, I think the, the good ones, the ones that are interested in, in kind of investing in entrepreneurial landscapes and small independent creators, uh, you know, they'll have a chat with you at the front end for 15, 20 minutes pro bono, absolutely every time. I, you know, I'll okay. take a call from anybody always. Oh, um, yeah. And then, yeah work with you on a flat rate to say, you know, well, what is the actual value of your contract? I, I usually say, I never want to strangle the baby in the crib. I never want to kill the thing before it's grown. I hope not. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, time travel stories, Hitler, you got a whole sort of a thing. To okay, well, if it's Hitler, we got Sure, <laughs> sure. But no, I, that's what I tell people is that, you know, I know that law is a cost center. I know that you don't want to have it kill what is your dream and what is your entrepreneurial ambition. And still, at bare minimum, if you're not going to hire a lawyer, you have to focus on a couple things. One, anytime you see a dollar sign in your contract, read those provisions six times. Uh, because if it's liability for you, if it's liability for them, you need to understand how the money can go from one direction to the other. Mm -hmm. The second thing in the contracts you're talking about, got to focus on that intellectual property. How is it defined? What are you giving to them? What are they not getting? What are you not getting? Uh, and, and that's really very important because you can accidentally sell your portfolio if the definitions aren't written correctly. Right. Uh, so in general, I think a lawyer is useful. You talk about a $3,000 contract, you know, I, I or someone else in your neighborhood, certainly local counsel is advantageous to some of these kinds of conversations, would try to bring that in at like 250 or 300 to try to make it so that you're not spending the whole thing on yeah. this kind of thing. But one thing that can happen is if you get counsel, just like a personal doctor, that you trust and that understands your situation is that that number and that efficiency can come down, can, can really be made a, a much more valuable prospect for you for contract four, five, six, or seven, when we know what we're looking for, when you can do a little, uh, a little negotiating on your own, and that maybe you can direct your counsel to, the contract is fine, but I'm worried about this indemnification provision. Can you read this for a half hour? And then those bills really start to come down. Right. Well, so this is like, I really wish that I had that kind of information when I signed all those really not so great contracts earlier in my career. <laughs> and everybody does that. No, yeah, I mean, it's one of the it things is. that I tell people is uh, lawyers cost money, yeah. but it is so vastly cheaper to get it right before signing or as part of that early process than to fix it. Fixing yeah. it is so much more expensive. Yeah. Especially the that, longer you wait on it too. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, uh, so 
in other words, uh, just go, call Hog Law, basically. <laughs> you uh, don't have to call me. I'm perfectly happy to take those calls, happy to have those conversations. Yeah. But even more than shilling for my law firm or my channel, <laughs> I, call someone. Uh, yeah. You might have somebody in your family that has done something like this. And if they haven't done exactly what you're doing, if they just are a DUI litigator, they probably know somebody who's doing something like what you're doing. They're connected. And so right? yeah. lawyers just, are all, yeah, the lawyer convention every year that uh, yeah. <laughs> they all well, know don't we have our, you know, Hogue Law is a business law firm. I'm not a litigator. One of the things I say on my channel all the time is I'm not the guy on Law & Order that shouts oh. objection. That's not what I do. Uh, You'd be and good so, at that, though. You'd be good yep, at that. Thank you're, you. You're a well-spoken person. So if somebody comes in and says, oh, I've got this uh, litigation, I say, okay, well, I know some people. And and that's mm -hmm. how law works, especially at smaller law firms. So yeah. if even if you know anybody related to the field of law, they probably have some contract or transactional lawyer that can help you. Otherwise, yeah, my phone lines are open. You can leave a comment in my YouTube videos and I'll find you. I was going to say, yeah, I mean, if you know, if you're an artist out there and you do have, uh, you know, quick or simple or what you feel might be common legal questions, uh, yeah. you have your virtual legality uh, YouTube channel where you are covering these sorts of topics as well. So it might be something that you could drop in a comment and uh, Rick may be able to help you with that. Uh, yeah. There is one more question that, that came sure. up. Uh, I would say this this one came up a while ago, but I remembered it. I kept a note on it. And because I've been running my own business since I was 16 years old, technically. Nice. I never registered my business until I was uh 29 so okay uh i did a lot of now i, I worked as an employee etc but not to get off topic the question that i want to ask you is and this is a question that many people have asked me is it required by law in the united states and again i should mention i should have mentioned this at the beginning most of what we're talking about is u.s law there oh laws yeah maybe different in other, <laughs> other countries i totally neglected yeah. to think of that but varies by jurisdiction yeah. yes uh but so is it required by law in the united states to register an LLC or a S corp or, or register a business in order to uh, sell product and make money? No, uh, the broad strokes answer to that is that if you are just going into business and doing exactly what you said, engaging in commerce, if you don't do anything else, the law will assume you are a sole practitioner or, or a sole uh, proprietorship, depending on the state that you're operating in. That being said, that's a bad idea. Um, and just to give the, the short form version of this, filing for a single member LLC is usually a one page document in the various states in which you're located. California is a bit of an exception because it's so freaking expensive there. So I could, I could do a whole video on California entities. But in general, <laughs> if you want to conduct commerce, you want to do it under an LLC because at bare minimum, some of the liability that you are taking on in part of your kind of entrepreneurial pursuits could potentially be shielded. So said another way, if you're starting a company and you've got a vendor contract of some kind, you've taken out a lease or something else, that contract might stop in terms of where the creditors can get at you at the company level rather than come against your house or your car or your other assets. Right. And if you are a sole proprietorship, you are, you're naked. Whatever you've agreed to as the sole proprietor is you individually. And so if you default on a contract, if there are other issues that you have with your business model and you have those liabilities, then they can say, well, the assets of the quote unquote company, the sole proprietorship are the house, the car, the video game consoles, whatever it might be. You don't want to lose and those. You don't want to lose those. <laughs> and right. while an LL, a single member LLC for a kind of creative pursuit of an individual doesn't maximize protection because one thing that happens under the law is you're always liable for your own acts. Mm -hmm. You know, as I tell people, if you run a lawn mowing service and you file for a single member LLC, the fact that you're an LLC isn't going to get you out of the liability for running over the guy's foot. If you did it personally, you're still liable. Mm -hmm. But in terms of contracts that you can have with your entity, you could have some shielding that doesn't otherwise exist. So a single member LLC doesn't require annual meetings, is generally a one page filing with the state, potentially an EIN number and a bank account, and then you're set and you don't really have to think about it ever again. And it can get you some of that protection. And also I should say that I should mention this as well, that some of the distribution partners that you may wanna work with, such as even going to Comic Cons, they require sure. that you have a, uh, a, a EIN number or some kind of a, uh, sales, uh, what, what is it called? Yeah, it makes sense. And it looks official, right? I mean, like just in terms of professional look, yeah. if you've got, even if it's your name LLC, yeah. uh, it's still something that says, hey, I thought about doing this as a livelihood. I, I thought about doing this as a pursuit. I've taken a few rudimentary steps to make that happen. Yeah. And so you know that I'm serious about this. Well, I know some people just put LLC on their, on their 
<laughs> on their business, even though they're still using their social security number. It's not an LLC. Well, they do. They just registered. slap an LLC on it. Well, don't do that. Yeah, don't do that's, that. That's, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, you're starting to diverge into corporate fraud. Don't do that. Forget yeah, yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> a little risky, a little risky. But uh, so uh, I, we don't know about, I mean, I don't know about other countries. I know that for, like I said, for probably the first 10 years until I started to make any kind of like, you know, real, real money. I mean, I moved to California and in California, it's like, yeah, you have a lot of restrictions. So yeah. it, it, it seemed it, to make more sense, especially if you're thinking someday you want to hire, have employees. You know, there are tax benefits oh, yeah. to running a, a company as well. And uh, I know you don't focus on tax law or anything like that, but uh, so you would advise it uh, even now. How could how could somebody go about registering an LLC, for instance, is that you said it's a one page document? Is it, this something that you could find on LegalZoom? Yeah, well, you can find it on LegalZoom. That's one of those where. Um, you know, if you use those services for a single member, you're probably going to be fine. You go into anything bigger than that, multiple members, corporations. I don't necessarily recommend that because you're probably spending as much to fix it later on. Yeah. Um, but yeah, for a single member LLC, let's just take Michigan. That's where I'm located. Uh, you can go onto their website and say, I want to form a new entity. You click domestic limited liability company and you're putting a name for the company, your name, your address, you're signing it, you're paying Michigan hundred dollars to take a look at it and you're done. Yeah. And and, the, and your entity exists. Then you file for an EIN with the federal government. And that takes five minutes because that's electronic as well. And then you open a bank account at your local bank and you're all set. Um, and a single member LLC, that's all you ever need. If you start adding members, you have an operating agreement. You have a whole bunch of legal stuff that you do need a lawyer for. Uh, but before that point in time, it's just going to be that single page document. And, and in terms of tax questions, yeah, I mean, the recommendation I always have is if you're talking about real money, coming in, if it's a real pursuit and it's going to be a company that's going to have all this money moving in and out, you generally want a lawyer you can trust and you want a, a startup or small business accountant that you can trust because there are ways to move things around an LLC and a, and a partnership that can be beneficial to you, that can move money around in years and things like that, that you want to have that accountant. They generally pay for themselves. So if you are pursuing this on a professional basis, there are a lot of good small startup accountants that are definitely not as expensive as the lawyer you're hopefully going to be getting as well. And, and they can help be your two guideposts for really starting up that business as a success. Yeah. And that changed everything for me uh, at a young age. And, and one point of advice that I want to give uh, young business owners and artists who are getting into the business of selling art is uh, don't just don't just go through like H&R Block or something like find a CPA who specializes in small business, and preferably a CPA who has a good relationship with a uh, tax lawyer or somebody who's familiar with tax law, uh, because sure. you'll find a lot of things that essentially reduce the amount of taxes like the government wants you to run a successful independent business you get a lot of incentives for doing uh for running your your business as a legit registered uh business as a corporation whereas uh sometimes employees get taxed a lot more for instance just as a general basis but again i don't want to give tax advice or anything <laughs> just want to no, say this is, hey, nothing's not official advice at all this is just education yeah yeah, yeah. and, and I, I but I, I found it took years to to cultivate a network of people who were sure uh, who suited the kind of business that i run there's no one size fits all and sometimes those uh like uh, turbo tax or h and r block they're sort of yep. a one size fits all for people who are filing as employees Oh, no. Yeah, exactly. And when you start to get into things like, you know, I, I'm happy to say Hogue Law is a is a professional limited liability company that's elected to be taxed as a corporation that's then made an S election. I mean, there's all sorts of stuff that you can go into right. what makes the most sense for your tax situation. Yeah. And, you know, you asked me earlier, you know, what should people know about hiring a lawyer? What can a lawyer do? I mean, one of the things that they can do is a good one with kind of roots in the community can have that network and can say, oh, you know, Bob or Gary does start up accounting work. Yeah. And I've worked with them a lot in the past and they're not dumb. Yeah, And, and, and so you can kind of get that advice. And it's scary at first. It, it, it was very uh, frightening for me to like register an LLC, you know, yeah. but then I learned about, you know, filing as an S corp and the benefits of doing this is like yeah. uh, you, you take it one step at a time. And, and the more you develop that skill, it's just like any other skill. You develop the skill to understand and the network to understand and have a greater network of connection where you can ask people questions and they are familiar with your situation. So it's not yeah. a scary and and you yeah it just it gets easier as you as you do it so it may be intimidating and very scary but if i could go back in time i would have started a, an llc when i was you know i don't think you can, can at 16 money, yeah. but it, it, by the time i was 18 i would have had an llc yeah and it would have saved me money and it would have got me on the road of uh, to thinking more about uh, how to structure our business and all the benefits that come from doing it that way 
Absolutely. So, so Rick, uh, I, you know, I'd love, I could talk to you for hours, brother, but uh, I do want to, I do want to not take up too much of your day today. And uh, I want to thank you so much for stopping by and sharing your expert knowledge uh, with everybody. And uh, if anybody wants to learn more about like right now, what are you talking about on your virtual legality channel? Anything you want to plug? Uh, yeah, you know, we just did a couple of really interesting videos. We, we are, of course, covering the Dr. Disrespect continuing legal saga uh, yeah. and Shroud now coming back to Twitch, which is one of That's the right. things I had suggested at the top of that legal saga. Yeah. But yesterday we did a bunch of really interesting videos, one of which I really found fascinating, which is that the shareholders of Electronic Arts declined the advisory vote for the Electronic Arts Executive Board's compensation package, which doesn't ban them from getting that compensation, but is an entirely unusual move in a lot of industries, but especially the video game industry. Electronic Arts has never had this pay package voted down. So that suggests a lot of stockholder unrest at that company. And as a corporate lawyer, you look at these kinds of things in a public fight at a public corporation and you say, well, there's a whole number of things that could happen from there, including potentially having a hostile board member sat on that board, which would be you know, terrible for the company, but probably fascinating for virtual legality. Dude, uh, as somebody who invests in video game stocks, you got me. I'm gonna be tuning in, <laughs> I'm gonna be hooked, glued to the screen for that one. So uh, fascinating, yeah, and I have friends that work at EA too, so oh boy. Oh, boy. Yeah, no, it's a big one. And, you know, if you if you like reading proxy statements, hopefully I made it a little <laughs> less dry as dust uh, well, than, uh, than you might otherwise think. That's what I love about your channel is that it, it breaks things down into terms that uh, I think are more accessible, and more uh, easy to understand for for us normal folks who. Well, that's <laughs> who the hope. I don't appreciate say you saying it. That's the dream. Yeah. All right. Uh, so, Rick, thank you so much for stopping by. And uh, uh, dudes, uh, until next time, I'll catch y'all. Mind you on the bond and ciao, baby. Oh, yeah.